Namaste, and welcome to our continuing series, Essays on the Gita, with our beloved Ranga. We're very happy that uh, this series has become so popular, and we thank you for attending. We are on the chapter two, The Divine Teacher. We will start the second chapter today. And as usual, Sri Aurobindo is very, very systematic. First, he has told us in the first chapter that the Gita, what our attitude should be when we are studying the Gita. It, we will take it for the advice, that it can, practical advice that it can give us. We will not concern ourselves too much with its philosophical aspects because we will use it as a, a practical guide in our sadhana. And we will not bother too much about the philosophical and the other dialectical aspects and compare it with other texts. That is something we will definitely avoid. The other thing that he also says is that We will, uh, our attitude to it should be that we will not be dogmatic about its teachings. We will keep ourselves flexible and we will not limit ourselves to any one scripture, however beautiful it be, because all human expression is always a limited representation of the ultimate, ineffable, unspeakable truth. The truth which cannot be put into words. So naturally any expression that we have of it, it may approach the truth to a great extent, but it is never the absolute truth which is unexpressed. So that's the attitude which will proceed. Then second chapter, he goes to the divine teacher. And then the next chapter, he goes to the human disciple. And then he goes into the Gita itself the philosophies, and then the practical aspects, he starts one by one. Okay, so, today we will go into the second chapter about the Divine Teacher. I will read the whole paragraph first, and then we will come back to it. The peculiarity of the Gita among the great religious books of the world is that it does not stand apart as a work by itself, the fruit of the spiritual life of a creative personality like Christ, Muhammad or Buddha or of an epoch of pure spiritual searching like the Veda and Upanishads, but is given as an episode in an epic history of nations and their wars and men and their deeds and arises out of a critical moment in the soul of one of its leading personages face to face with the crowning action of his life, a work terrible, violent and sanguinary, at the point when he must either recoil from it altogether or carry it through to its inexorable completion. It matters little whether or no as modern criticism supposes, the Gita is a later composition inserted into the mass of the Mahabharata by its author in order to invest its teaching with the authority and popularity of the great national epic. There seem to me to be strong grounds against this supposition, for which, besides, the evidence extrinsic or internal is in the last degree scanty and insufficient. But even if it be sound, there remains the fact that the author has not only taken pains to interweave his work inextricably into the vast web of the larger poem, but is careful again and again to remind us of the situation from which the teaching has arisen. He returns to it prominently, not only at the end, but in the middle of his profoundest philosophical disquisitions. We must accept the insistence of the author and give its full importance 
to this recurrent preoccupation of the teacher and the disciple. The teaching of the Gita must therefore be regarded not merely in the light of a general spiritual philosophy or ethical doctrine, but as bearing upon a practical crisis in the application of ethics and spirituality to, to human life. For what that crisis stands, what is the significance of the battle of Kurukshetra and its effect on Arjuna's inner being, we have first to determine if we would grasp the central drift of the ideas of the Gita. <clears throat> Uh, I slipped when I said that the he goes on to the philosophy. So these are the four things that first of all is approach to the Sramdhu's approach to the Gita. Second is the divine teacher. Then next is the human disciple. And then Kurukshetra. Kurukshetra, the war. And that's a very important question. So the necessity of war, is war justified or not? There are three chapters on that. A very, very important. What is the role of violence in the world? Does it have a justification or not? That's it. It's of great interest to you, yes. particularly because you always worry about the Second World War and the Nazi uh, cruelties. Well, I'm, I'm also recording war and self-determination. Yes. So, <laughs> that's right. It's very important. So, there's three chapters on war and violence in the world. Whether it is justified or not, what are the conditions when it is justified? So that is there. I do so, have one question. Yeah. He speaks about the author of the Gita. Yeah. The author of the Mahabharata. Yes. Who is the author? The author is the uh, is, uh, Vyasa, Vyasa. The great sage. So Vyasa has written the yes. Gita also. Yes. And Ramayana is written by Valmiki, a poet. And Vyasa also is a poet, but he is also a philosopher. In fact, there are the Brahma Sutras of Badarayana, which are part of the Vedantic teaching. And Badarayana is only another name for Vyasa. Ah. So, that is what ah. is suspected. Sri Aurobindo puts them both at the top of all poets. Yeah, absolutely. And I am reading now the Ramayana in the um, original and the poetic aspect of it. All that is there in English poetry, alliteration, okay, suggestions, sound effects, onomatopoeic, yes. everything is there even in that, in those uh, lines, okay. Suggestions, okay, repetition of words with different meanings, it's fantastic, it's really so, so you are reading it in Sanskrit? Yes. Wow. I want to do that with Mahabharata also, but it will take a little time. Started too late in life. <laughs> okay. So let's get back to the beginning of the the divine teacher. <clears throat> the peculiarity of the Gita among the great religious books of the world is that it does not stand apart as a work by itself the fruit of the spiritual life of a creative personality like Christ, Muhammad or Buddha, or of an epoch of pure spiritual searching like the Veda and Upanishads, but is given as an episode in an epic history of nations and their wars and men and their deeds and arises out of a critical moment in the soul of one of its leading personages face to face with the crowning action of his life, a work terrible, violent and sanguinary at a point where, uh, sorry, when he must either recoil from it altogether or carry it through to its inexorable completion. So, the funny part is that Christ, the Bible is based on the, on Christ's teachings. The Quran is based on the Muhammad's teachings and Buddha is the uh, the Buddhist texts are based on Buddha's teachings. But neither Christ wrote the Bible, neither did Buddha write the texts. They were written later on by the followers and the disciples. 
okay about muhammad also i don't think that he wrote the quran it must have been his teachings which are inculcated uh, in incorporated into the text because later on after the quran there were additional texts which are added on to the quran like the hadith and that is where all sorts of distortions come in so uh that is one of the problems being discussed all over the world now because islam is there everywhere all over the world it's one of the largest religions so that is being discussed now that should we accept the auxiliary teachings or not and then there are many branches and all that so but the gita is doesn't stand by itself although we have taken it out of context and we use it as a a practical guide in spiritual life but it is really an episode in the teaching of the mahabharata in the exposition of the mahabharata the interesting part is that some people think that it's a spiritual teaching so what does it got to do with the epic so they say it must have been added later on but that's not uh, at same the does not subscribe to that view at all because there is a continuous reference in the gita itself to the situation in which he is there okay so so constantly you are reminded that it is part of the mahabharat <laughs> so that's the what same is saying not only that there is another thing which same is not very clearly mentioning here but the symbolism of the mahabharat fits in very well with the spiritual um, the teachings of the gita so there is a great relation between the two and same the does not support that okay so so very clear arjuna is faced with a situation where he has a a moral training and now he has to his morality tells him that is wrong to kill people and particularly his own people even if it is justified to kill on such a scale is impossible and added to this killing is the thing that he has to kill his own teachers his own grandfathers his own relatives in laws he has to kill all these people how can that be possible so he fails and he he has a nervous reaction his bow falls is the bow falls from his hand he is in a, a feverish condition and he starts trembling so this so people would say that what a fine man he is refusing to do something criminal but sri krishna <laughs> tells him exactly the opposite he tells him that no this is a weakness and then he goes on to give the teaching okay so this is the situation <laughs> and the word sanguinary means bloody bl- bloody from the french word sang okay sometimes there is a relation between english and french a lot of common words and sanguinary means blood <clears throat> bloody at the point when he must either recoil from it altogether which he de- does he recoils from it altogether or carry it through to its inexorable completion and that's what the shikrish is encouraging him to do stand up and fulfill your duty in life okay and the question of swabhava and swadharma comes up there and it's a very interesting discussion in the gita also it comes up okay so we'll come to that when we come to that we'll discuss it it matters little whether or no this is again from those english normally you would have said whether or not <laughs> yes we would normally <laughs> but he is he wrote this 100 years ago okay so it ma- not even 100 even more <laughs> it matters little whether or no as modern criticism supposes the gita is a later composition inserted into the mass of the mahabharat by its author in order to invest its teaching with the authority and popularity of the great national epic so but this is a this is a charge and uh, it can be contested easily even apart from what shramdu is saying because he is a, a great spiritual master he cares a little for fame and name okay they are saying for the popularity of the national epic so to make it more popular but that certainly wouldn't have been his um his aim in doing that okay so <laughs> there seem to me to be strong grounds against this supposition for which 
बिसाइड्स द एविडेंस बिसाइड्स द एविडेंस एक्सट्रिंग्स एक्सट्रेंसिक और इंटरनल इंटरनल इज फ्रॉम द राइटिंग इट सेल्फ और एक्सट्रेंसिक एक्सट्रेंसिक मीन्स एक्सटर्नल थिंग्स विच डोंट कंसर्न द महाभारत द टाइम इन विच ही रोट एंड अदर थिंग्स ओके इज इन द लास्ट डिग्री स्कैंटी एंड इनसफिशेंट बट इवन इफ इट बी साउंड देर रिमेन्स अ फैक्ट दैट द ऑथर हैज नॉट ओनली टेकन पेन्स टू इंटरवीव हिज वर्क inextricably into the vast web of the larger poem but is careful again and again to remind us of the situation from which the teaching has arisen he returns to it prominently not only at the end but in the middle of his profoundest philosophical disquisitions the word disquisition means a piece of long or complex discourse okay we must accept the insistence of the author and give its full importance to this recurrent preoccupation of the teacher and the disciple what is the preoccupation of the teacher constantly reminding him of the situation in which he is linking it with the epic <coughs> the circumstances of the epic so the teaching of the gita must therefore be regarded not merely in the light of a general spiritual philosophy or ethical doctrine a moral doctrine but as bearing upon a practical crisis in the application of ethics and spirituality this is the big problem which arjuna is facing should he apply an ethical solution morality or should he apply a spiritual standard so this is the big problem and all those who are in the spiritual field realizes that morality is man man made the mind of man is giving morality that's origin but spirituality is not man made it is a self that lays down the conditions are for the spiritual life so spiritual life is not man made it comes from the higher planes of consciousness but morality comes from the mind of man this discussion is also very clearly given in the uh, in the synthesis of yoga where he says very clearly that there are four standards of conduct i'm going a little out of the way but just to because it's relevant here there are four standards of conduct very largely we can divide human action into four standards of conduct first of all there is the egoistic standard when you are at a level where you have to take care of yourself you have to develop yourself is not negative but it's even you have to develop yourself fully i want to develop my mind i want education okay i want a happy life which is valid in a certain sense okay so that's a egoistic standard you pay full attention to yourself and your development but what happens is if you are too egoistic and too self centered then it's likely that you are going to come into con- conflict with your neighbor i am not going to play you are not allowed to play your loud music at midnight it is disturbing your um, your neighbor that's a problem that is being discussed in india now whether the uh masjids the mosques have the right to loudly at 5 o'clock in the morning you the azan what they call whether it is valid rather than getting disturbed you want to listen to the quran fine but why do you have to make others forcibly listen to your so this is the moral question that is being discussed today so the moral question is you are no right to kill anybody else so but the spiritual is slightly different so that's a discussion that is taking place so the, i come back to the standards of conduct so the first standard of conduct you have the full right to develop yourself and pay attention to yourself and that's what happens at the animal level and at the human level below the mental most human beings don't have a a very very what we call the pure mind the pure mind is that which has got logic objectivity and search for truth 
not the physical mind and the vital mind but the ordinary man uses his physical mind and vital mind mostly uses the higher logic only to support the lower truth okay but the, the search for true knowledge is there only in the scholar the scientist the philosopher okay those who are mentally developed that's rare sir and says <laughs> so the second standard is the social standard society steps in and says you can't do this you can't do that so the first standard of conduct is egoism valid at its level but the moment you consider the society at large you have to take care of your neighbor you have to take care of society you can't do anything you're developing yourself but in the process don't disturb the others so the society steps in you can't steal you can't tell lies you can't do this you can't do that society lays down certain conditions you can't cross a red light in traffic so these are all social rules which apply you have to ride, drive on the right side of the road or the left side in other countries so these are all social standards they are social they are imposed by society on the individuals the next standard is the moral standard the third one is the moral standard apart from society's non religious rules okay like you can't cross a red light that's nothing to do with religion or anything it's not a moral rule it's just a practical rule similarly individual now finds certain standards of conduct which are not acceptable to his mind so good and bad these ideas come in at the mental level and there individual imposes his own ideas on society the second level society is imposing restrictions on the individual in the third level of conduct morality he the individual thinks of what is good and bad and imposes his rules on society and they are usually accepted because they are acceptable the last is no rules apply that's a spiritual standard which is quite in contradiction with the moral standards so these are the four Lot standards of things here yeah so in oroville when mother makes one rule no drugs those people should leave absolutely ideal condition that is yes. what you would call spiritual anarchy yes. a spiritual anarchy can exist when everybody is developed enough but otherwise it can become a, a legal and social anarchy and that's what's happening to a certain extent there there is a conflict of interests and people are quarreling among themselves so spiritual anarchy is the highest standard and one day it will come but right now man is not yet ready for that <laughs> yeah i also remembered one other thing uh, apropos of what you are saying about the mind that i read that sri arbindo wrote to a disciple and he said the mother and i have discussed him and find that he does not have very much of a mind okay amazing huh that he, <laughs> he and mother would discuss yes. this person he so always discuss things with the mother and then reply they were one team they were not separate individuals <laughs> okay so this is the main teaching at the earlier level is the problem that arjuna is facing should he follow a moral teaching which he has been brought up in and he has been given the training or should he go to a spiritual level which he is not capable of but he is ready for the spiritual teaching and that is what shri krishna gives him okay and tells him you follow the spiritual law and not the moral law we'll come to that when we come we'll discuss in detail so the teaching of the gita must therefore be regarded not merely in the light of a general spiritual philosophy or ethical doctrine but as bearing upon a practical crisis in the application of ethics and spirituality to human life i might as well mention here that the gita is so practical that nowadays it is being taught in india at least in the schools of management if you are to be a manager and you have to manage maybe 100 workers or 2000 workers first you learn to manage yourself <laughs> 
and then only you can manage others. So it is being taught in many schools. Okay, the Gita is so practical. What I'm saying is, it's not high flown philosophy and meaningless and not applicable in life. It is absolutely applicable in life. That's the whole point. Very clear, practical crisis and application of ethics and spirituality. It's a very, very well understood principle now in India at the higher levels of society. Yes, they understand. And they all study the Gita. <laughs> so, okay. For what that crisis stands, what is the significance of the battle of Kurukshetra and its effect on Arjuna's inner being, we have, to f we have first to determine if we would grasp the central drift of the ideas of the Gita. So he's saying, what is the battle of Kurukshetra? What is the significance of the battle of Kurukshetra? Kurukshetra also is a, a symbol, a very clearly a symbol. But it is also history. It's very interesting because both Ramayana and Mahabharata is not only symbolic, but they are very, very, their truths are applicable in life. And both these huge, fantastic epics have captured the imagination of India for thousands of years. And they are also part history. <laughs> okay. I can give many examples, but definitely Ayodhya still exists, the capital of Ram. Okay. In the, um, in the Mahabharata, Kurukshetra is still there in Punjab. Okay. So, all these, uh, there are uh, many, many references which tell you that there were historical events which actually. Krishna was definitely a living person. There is a huge debate about Christ, whether he really lived or not, and Krishna also. But Krishna was definitely there because um, there are many, many things which show that he was a. In fact, Srivadho himself experienced Sri Krishna coming and giving him. A teaching in in jail. Huh? So, it's very clear that just as Vivekananda also was living, but he came in a subtle body and gave teachings to uh, Sri Aurobindo. Sri Krishna was guiding him in the Gita's teachings as well as the Vedas in jail. So, very clear that he was a, a living. So, it's not only poetry and symbolism, but it's also history. So, this is what he says about the teaching, the revenge. Very obviously, a great body of the profoundest teaching cannot be built around an ordinary occurrence which has no gulfs of deep suggestion and hazardous difficulty behind its superficial and outward aspects and can be governed well enough by the ordinary everyday standards of thought and action. These are indeed, oh sorry, there are indeed three things in the Gita which are spiritually significant, almost symbolic, typical of the profoundest relations and problems of the spiritual life and human existence at its roots. They are the divine personality of the teacher, the characteristic relations with his disciple and the occasion of the teaching. So, first is the Shri Krishna, the divine teacher, his characteristic relations with the disciple and that's very interesting also. We'll see later on what he says about that. There's a relation between Arjuna, the human being and Shri Krishna, the divine. They are connected. In some philosophies, there's no connection between the two. Man is created but he has no connection with the divine. He can't, he can never become the divine. He can have a a relation perhaps, but that's all. Okay, so. The, so the three things are the divine personality of the teacher, his characteristic relations with the disciple, his disciple, and the occasion of the teaching, which is the Kurukshetra. The teacher is God himself, descended into humanity. The idea of the, the concept of the avatar is very common in India. It is almost non-existent anywhere else that the human can also be divine in essence. So, in fact, it is denied in most other places. <laughs> human beings are imperfect and the divine is perfect. There can be no connection between them. 
but here you are that the avatar is part human but also part divine okay. essentially divine the teacher is god himself descended into humanity the disciple is the first arjuna as we might say in modern language the representative man of his age closest friend and chosen instrument of the avatar he is protagonist in an immense work and struggle the secret purpose of which is unknown to the actors in it known only to the incarnate godhead who guides it all from behind the veil of his unfathomable mind of knowledge okay the occasion is a violent crisis of that work and struggle at the moment when the anguish and moral difficulty and blind violence of its apparent movements forces itself with the shock of a visible revelation on the mind of its representative man and raises the whole question of the meaning of god in the world and the goal and drift and sense of human life and conduct so this is also very true this is very typical of uh, the situation in which arjuna is there he is faced with a, a horrific action and usually this type of thing also happens very often in life you turn towards the inner life after there is something disastrous in your life because you start questioning what is the meaning of life i'll give you just one instance okay and then uh, how it can change your life the embroidery department in the ashram the embroidery department okay that was the building which was bought by uh, a very well known and very well uh, uh, respected lawyer in india and he was dorasame ayangar okay he was very well known all over the in india and he was a very honest and scrupulous man even after he passed away the newspapers were speaking about him for 3 4 months okay and he was a disciple of shri ramdo so he bought part of the ashram and he bought this building and he had a i think uh, two daughters maybe two or three i don't remember but one of them had a young boy okay uh, a, uh, his uh, her son was a, a nine year old who was run over by a, a truck now imagine the pain of the mother okay why did this boy have to die at the age of 9 why was he at all made to live if he has to go away in 9 years time and give us all this pain and suffering so you start wondering about the meaning of life what is the meaning of life if you are not given a full scope what is suddenly it is happening it's a mystery and then you start looking for answers so this sort of disaster very often can cause you to turn to the meaning of life and the world and what is all this you start wondering i know of another case in the ashram where uh, when the father died instead of having grief and uh, pain and suffering this person suddenly had the experience of the self a calm quiet attitude dwelt in her and was born so often this either a death or something very disastrous can change that's a symbolism being given in the it's not a symbolism it's an example that here he is he has not yet committed the crime but he is forced to do it because of his kshatriya hood he is a kshatriya and it's his role to defend the right and punish the wrong so he is faced with this problem but in the world over the ages we have seen in tragic circumstances that men have turned against the divine yes and accused him of not being divine that's right that also happens when something happens to you when the ego is very prominent in the being why did the divine do this to me why is he making me suffer mm. <laughs> this is very common okay what did i do that i deserve this punishment from god god is not punishing you but that's a impression that one gets i know several cases like that ah. <laughs> so this is the situation so it is something so drastic and so he is saying that in this para he is saying that purposely 
the gita is dealing with the one of the most violent events that can happen in the world it's not taking a very very day to day event mm. which should be you know okay it's all right not like that it's going to the maximum difficulty should i kill or not kill and that also my own people my grandfather my uh, own teacher i have to kill him in battle <laughs> so that's it what he's saying here in the para so we'll quickly go through the para okay very obviously a great body of the profoundest teaching cannot be built around an ordinary occurrence which has no gulfs of deep suggestion and hazardous difficulty so that's why you take the maximum difficult situation and build your uh, theory on it which has no gulfs of deep suggestion and hazardous difficulty behind its superficial and outward aspects and can be governed well enough by the ordinary everyday standards of thought and action so the situation that arjuna is facing is not a a home problem or some really personal relationship it's a huge problem for him that's what they are saying there are indeed three things in the gita which are spiritually significant almost symbolic note the word almost symbolic okay because they are also practical and they are also historical <laughs> that's why it's not only symbol okay typical of the profoundest relations and problems of the spiritual life and of human existence at its roots so it's not only symbol but it's also practical life there are so he is telling you what the three things are the divine person of the teacher which is the subject of our present chapter they are the divine personality of the teacher is characteristic relations with the disciple and the occasion of the teaching you must also remember that shri krishna was a very close friend of the pandavas and they used to have even social meetings in other words he was a friend the suggestion is that the divine is your friend <laughs> we often take him exactly in the opposite but he is a friend <laughs> he is always there for you and then finally the occasion of the teaching which is the kurukshetra war okay the teacher is god himself descended into humanity the disciple is the first as we might say in modern language the representative man of his age a close as friend and chosen instrument of the avatar his protagonist in an immense work and struggle the secret purpose of which is unknown to the actors in it known only to the incarnate godhead who guides it all from behind the veil of his unfathomable mind of knowledge so this is also true that all human beings have a role to play in the physical world and they are doing it unconsciously god knows about the plan is but we don't know what the plan is what is our life meant for you have to discover it so that's what same they saying here the occasion is a violent crisis of that work and struggle at the moment when the anguish and moral difficulty and blind violence now note anguish and moral difficulty morality is the problem and blind violence of his apparent movements forces itself with the shock of a visible revelation on the mind of its representative man and raises the whole question of the meaning of god in the world and the goal and drift and sense of human life and conduct so can we say this was also why shri arbindo was so concerned about world war 2 yes absolutely he saw it as a kurukshetra yes yes he saw it as he and he saw it clearly that if the axis powers win the world will be plunged for centuries into a situation from which it will take many many centuries to come out again and that's why he took up the uh, challenge and from pondicherry sitting here he was manipulating forces in the physical world and giving help to the allies and at that time the main protagonist in that whole thing was churchill yeah and shrimdo says It's very interesting. Churchill was a very interesting character, and you can really start wondering about it. Now, so many movies have come out about Churchill, yeah. and 
he was considered at that time the popular nation is that churchill was a great leader but from the human point of view he was a, a disgustingly despicable character <laughs> okay he caused the death of millions in a famine on purpose the 1942 famine in bengal was because all the rice that was available in india were being diverted to the troops okay this is well known fact and he said what is it when the english themselves raise a question that you are going to cause a famine and many will die he says what does it matter if they die they are breeding like rabbits anyway <laughs> that was his comment <laughs> and he was a, a very big racialist everybody knows that so in fact that's why they are pulling down these statues and all that in england today <laughs> the other thing was that Sri Aurobindo, I believe, said he even spoke through church. That's right, and that's exactly what I'm coming to. That's my point. That from the ordinary point of view, you may be a a most ordinary or even someone whom you consider disgusting character, but he was an instrument of the divine. And Sri Aurobindo said, "I am able to work through him." Yeah. And not only that. The other interesting thing is that Churchill was conscious. He made a, a statement in the Parliament that I know we are going to win because I can sense a guidance. He made this statement in, in in Parliament. So he didn't know who was guiding him, but he knew that there is a guidance from within. That's why he was so sure of his victory. In fact, the Dunkirk thing, okay. the dunkirk uh, incident was very interesting because all his generals all the military people in in england were telling him start negotiating with hitler because we are sure to lose 300000 of our troops are lying like uh, sitting ducks in dunkirk all um, uh, germany has to do is come and throw a couple of bombs and finish the war is won but it didn't happen <laughs> and he refused to surrender he said no i won't because there was guidance from within <laughs> so in fact there are many interesting movies which have just come out now oh, when i listen to some of his speeches oh fantastic they're almost sri arbindo's words absolutely his most famous speech we shall fight on the beaches we shall fight in war we shall do this we shall do that we are not going to ever surrender he shows the the great power that he was being uh, given from somewhere else <laughs> and interestingly is not a subject of the gita but after the war he lost the election and the reason is that most people in britain found him a horrible character okay <laughs> and he was thrown out of power and he told his wife i can't understand how this nation is throwing me out after i won the war so then uh, he was a very big wit na churchill was very witty so he told his wife his wife told him winston don't worry it must be a blessing in disguise he told him it's a blessing but in disguise so he retorted he said it is extremely well disguised right now <laughs> so so that's the thing and then he came back into power afterwards yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. India has from ancient times held strongly a belief in the reality of the avatar the descent into form the revelation of the godhead in humanity in the west this belief has never really stamped itself upon the mind because it has been presented through exoteric christianity note exoteric not esoteric christianity as a theological dogma without any roots in the reason and general consciousness and attitude towards life but in india it has grown up and persisted as a logical outcome of the vedantic view of life and taken firm root in the consciousness of the race what is the vedantic view of life that everything is the divine there is only one divine there is nothing undivine that's the thing so naturally the human being can be divine so the avatar is possible all existence is a manifestation of god because he is the only existence 
and nothing can be except as either a real figuring or else a figment of that one reality there is a a uh, philosophical suggestion here which we will discuss next time therefore every conscious being is in part or in some way a descent of the infinite into the apparent finiteness of name and form but it's a veiled manifestation and there is a gradation between the supreme being of the divine and the consciousness shrouded partly or wholly by ignorance of self in the finite the conscious embodied soul is a spark of the divine fire and that soul in man opens out to self knowledge as it develops out of ignorance of self into self being the divine also pouring itself into the forms of the cosmic existence is revealed ordinarily in an efflorescence of its powers in energies and magnitudes of its knowledge love joy developed force of being in degrees and phases of its divinity but when the divine consciousness and power taking upon itself the human form and the human mode of action possesses it not only by powers and magnitudes by degrees and outward faces of itself but out of its eternal self knowledge when the unborn knows itself and acts in the frame of the mental being and the appearance of birth that is the height of the conditioned manifestation conditioned manifestation it is the full and conscious descent of the godhead it is the avatar so he has defined what the avatar is and we will uh, go into detail next time mm-hmm. we'll reread this one it's full of suggestions so we'll see what it is saying okay so thank you rang namaste all